In podcast episode number 167, I talked about how you can set up your training so that you can avoid unnecessary stress or anxiety for your dog. And today I'm following up that episode by sharing how you can replace your dog's stress, anxiety, or reactivity with some good old fashioned confidence. Hi, I'm Susan Garrett. Welcome to Shape by Dog. I have got a lot to pack into today's podcast, but nothing more important than what I have up front. And that is, there's two things that are super important about helping dogs who are stressed or anxious or maybe are reactive. Number one is, it's your mindset. Because when you have a dog that you know is a little bit worried in certain environments or the opposite. They get a little bit out of control and they like lunge at people because they want to meet them and they bark and want to chase skateboarders. And it looks like they're trying to eat them and they really don't. They're just super friendly. And, or you have a dog that has moved from super friendly and maybe has grown a little bit reactive to those skateboarders. So wherever you are with your dog, there now is some anxiety in you because of what the history of your dog has built in you and the thought that that might happen again, but more importantly, the reaction to the people that are around when it happens. And you might hear things like, you, you really think you should have a dog like that out at the park, or you should get a good trainer for that dog, or that dog is a complete a-hole. I can't believe you're not correcting that dog or other unsolicited advice that I spoke about in podcast episode number 163. And what happens to you? Number one, you're embarrassed. Number two, you feel a little bit of shame. And number three, you know your dog's a good dog. You know these people are misunderstanding him. So then there's a little bit of guilt because you're feeling bad that you didn't show up for your dog or you didn't put in the training to get the dog to a better place. So there's some regrets about how you've trained and, oh, I bet Susan Garrett could have done a better job. And I bet you, you know, people wouldn't talk about you if you lived with somebody else. All of that is not good for you. And it certainly isn't good for your dog. And it's un freaking necessary. It's not your fault, but I don't want to you to feel like a victim. I want to turn you into a victor tonight. Because in order for us to bring out the best in our dog, number one, we've got to think the best of our dog. And number two, we've got to think the best of ourselves. We have to believe that it, me as that dog's owner can bring out the best. So number one, do you believe that your dog can be amazing? Like, you know, I, I spoke about this on a recent live. If I knocked on your door today and said, Hey, I'd like to show up every day at uh, five o'clock in the afternoon and train your dog for you. Is that all right? Would you say no? Now, if I said, I'm going to do that for like six months, do you think your dog, you'd see a difference in your dog? Of course, right? Because I've seen and helped train tens of thousands of dogs. There is no problem that is going to put me off. And so, all right, we've checked number one, you can believe in your dog and what's possible. What we have to do is help you to believe in yourself. Now, the first thing that we have to do next time your neighborhood garbage day rolls around, might be this week, it might be next. What I want you to do when you're putting out the trash, I want you just imagine you're zipping open your chest, you're reaching into your heart, you're taking the, any guilt, shame, regrets, embarrassment, low self-esteem that people's reactions have put there. And I want you to, you know, polish up that old heart of yours and tie up that bag nice and tight and let's kick it to the curb, my friend. Because let me just give you an example. We all are working on stuff with our dogs. So, some people, God bless them, have gone out and got a rescue dog that may have had some bad upbringing and may end up with some fear or confidence issues. And so that is what you are working on. Yeah, you're teaching your dog tricks and stuff, but you're really working on helping him to be more comfortable when you go out in public and when he sees some of his triggers. Now, there's other people who have got their first golden retriever that they have got entered in their first agility trial. 
Both of you for the last few years have been working on your stuff. Both of you are doing the best you can. And here on Saturday, you both go out to the park. Now, your dog barks and lunges at a skateboarder and you get told off. This person's golden retriever goes in the agility ring and she wasn't really prepared the way she should have. So the dog runs amok, goes off course, knocks some bars, comes out of the ring. There's nobody saying, how dare you come to an agility trial with such a poorly trained dog? You should never show up at this park again. Why would you bring that dog here? Because society accepts that our trick our agility, our, you know, Frisbee dogs aren't going to be perfect all the time, but society thinks everybody's dog is Lassie and anybody that's not showing up as Lassie, no, finding Timmy in the well, that you have done a bad job. If you failed, you've done a bad job. If you fail at agility, oh man, that was a headache, wasn't it? But if you failed with your dog's confidence, then your dog's an a-hole and you're a bit of a jerk for bringing him out. You've got to let go of that, guys. That's not serving you. You have got to let that go because I want you to see your dog the way you see your dog in your living room. You love that dog. I want you to see that dog everywhere you go. Yes, we have to manage our dog's behavior. Yes, we have to make sure that we can keep them under threshold. Yes, we have to help grow their confidence but I give you permission to always look at your dog the way you do on their best days. And if somebody comes up and tries to give you advice on it, just say, Hey, we're out here doing the best we can. We're learning from Susan Garrett and I know we're far from perfect, but we have come so far and I hope you can just be patient with me as I try and help my dog have the best life possible. I don't know that top of mind, just whatever doesn't put you in a conversation with them. I'd love to talk to you, but really my dog needs me. Okay. Believe in your dog, believe in yourself. Okay. Now I got some help for you. I've got a list that I put together for you. It was going to be like your five most important things. And then it grew to be, okay, your top 10. And I'm not going to tell you the number now because you might turn away. Number one, we have to create clarity because our goal is to create confidence, to replace that anxiety in the dog. So it doesn't matter if the dog is getting worried or they're going cray cray. We have to give them clarity because you know what your dog will do when they're overwhelmed. Do you know what? I know what I do when I'm overwhelmed. We know what our dogs will do. They'll either, you know, go crazy and start trying to run and do the zoomies and, or they withdraw and they, they look a little bit frightened. So we want to never see that in your training, you've got to make sure that you're training with clarity. And if you're somebody who's using food lures or props to train your dog, you should never do that. Not even once without a plan of how you're going to fade those props or lures, because the more you lure a dog or use props, the more the behavior stays with the food lures or those props. So you want to, if you want to use food lures, now, if you've been listening to me, you know that I don't use food lures in my training. If you want to do that, then you've got to get rid of them quickly and start growing the behavior with reinforcement that comes after the dog has offered you a response, not before. We want to grow that behavior because that helps grow the dog's confidence because they're making the choices, not following lures. Okay. So we've got to create clarity by having a plan. If you're using food lures before you ever start, how are we going to get rid of them? Number two, take any behavior you want to train and break it down into small pieces and just focus on growing that one piece. And your dog's going to be happy. You know, that was super. That was easy. Now what else is there? So if we wanted the dog to walk beside us on leash, if you go to podcast episode number 76, I talk about a few games that you can use to help create uh, confidence with these dogs. And so take walking on a loose leash, like People put the leash on the puppy and expect that they're going to walk beside them. How about in your living room? You just give the dog a reason to want to be beside you. We want our dog to be seen on our seam, right? So, you know, they don't have to be glued to your seam, but somewhere in arm's distance length from the, and I like to, you know, shape that with 
perch work pivots and spins is another video you find on YouTube. All right. So break those down, but you're not going to go walking at the beach where the dog's going to have all these distractions until you've split that up and let the dog know how to get into position, how to, to turn their butt around, how, where you want their head to be and et cetera, et cetera. So there's lots of little layers. So break things down. My mentor, Bob Bailey always says, be a splitter, not a lumper. Okay. Next, we want to inoculate your dog to being stressed after failure. All right. Now, a lot of people will say, oh, we never want our dogs to fail. So we're going to just make sure that we grow behaviors in a way that they never make a mistake. It is possible to grow behaviors with a dog never failing, but what we're doing is we're never allowing the dog to, to experience failure. So what's going to happen if they fail? Because sometimes you might not be perfect as a trainer. Things might go wrong. The dog doesn't get the reinforcement that they expect. So I like to get that inoculation to failure early and where it's so overwhelmingly desirable to keep going, your dog's not going to give up. So my game, it's your choice. I'll leave a link in the show notes. It's the best game to help a dog fail, fail fast, fail forward, get ready for the next one because they're failing in the presence of something they love. Okay. So inoculate your dog to failing by building in small failures that they don't mind, they can recover from fast because it's not about failing, it's about recovering and moving on in your work. Number four, in podcast number 86, I talked about the arousal curve. And so if you remember the arousal curve, dogs at the far right end are over aroused. So they can't think straight, they can't listen, they're just so excited. And we need those dogs to bring them in to their zone of genius so that they can perform at their peak. Dogs at the other end, they're under aroused. They're like, yeah, I don't really need to do anything today. So we need to get them more excited. So there's games for both. There's triggers that we need to build into both of those dogs, but you're not going to do it unless you're, you have an awareness. So if you just, if you're used to like, oh, my dog's on the coach, Hey, let's go do some training. And you just start, you know, giving them cookies you're going to be blown away by how much better your dog will be when you start building an arousal state first and then start training. I call it relationship building, but really it's about creating focus by changing the dog's physiology. Number five, and I am going to stop here. We're going to have to do another podcast to go through some more of these. Number five, believe and learn from the dog. When we're training we're giving our dogs information and they're giving us feedback on what they learned and you have to believe them. So if you go out for the night and you come home and you see a big old hole chewed in the middle of your living room couch and you get like, you flip out. What did you do? What an a-hole you are. That means your expectation for your dog's behavior was here. I'm going out for the night and you're just going to chill on the couch. You're just going to be, you know, it doesn't matter that I didn't get a chance to walk you today. It doesn't matter that there were some kids knocking on the door and screaming and getting you all anxious. It doesn't matter. This was my expectation. This is your capability that you showed me tonight. Now that gap, the gap is where your frustration comes in with your dog and it's completely unnecessary if you believe your dog, when your dog says, uh, this is my best. Do you see that? <sighs> what you're seeing right here? That's my best. Yeah. Your best is chewing a hole in my freaking thousand dollar couch. That's the best I can give you in the environment with the education I've got right now. And so mind shift for you, believe the dog and learn from them. How can I help grow your confidence so that you aren't going to be anxious when I go out? Or how can I manage your behavior until we can see a change in you? And it is possible, guys, it is possible, but you have to be patient and you have to be willing, be open to recognizing that that's their best. We can raise their best through the education we can give them and the different environments that we can put them in to help generalize good behaviors in all environments, but they don't come out of the womb that way. And if you're bringing on a rescue dog, then you're bringing on a little bit of baggage and that's okay. 
because it's the best they can do with that baggage they've got, and it will get better. Going back to the beginning of this podcast, it's about your belief in your dog. And if you believe in your dog, you're going to do what you need to, to grow your understanding so that you can bring out the best in your dog. If you were to Google help for my anxious, stressed, or reactive dog, you're going to get a lot of great suggestions. Things like uh, essential oils you should use or nutritional supplements that you should include or not include, compression shirts that may be of benefit. And a lot of this is really, really good advice, guys. And that is not what I'm going to be talking about in today's podcast. Today is a continuation of podcast episode number 168, where I talk about some of the elements of dog training that I think are critical for dogs who are stressed or anxious or need more confidence or potentially are reactive. And today is a continuation, but I've got a lot of things to get in this podcast. And I want you to keep two things in mind. First of all, please listen to the last podcast. I think it is just so important, especially the first bit where I talk about your mindset. I mean, I think all podcasts are important that we put out, but the beginning of that is just so important for all dog owners to listen to. The second thing is I'm going to cover a lot of suggestions in today's podcast. And I believe any one of these 10 suggestions could be a podcast on their own. So if there's something that you would go, Susan, I really would like more information about this, or can you give me a deep dive or examples or do another whole podcast on this topic? Please jump over to YouTube and leave a comment over on YouTube or send our team a note at wagatdogsat.com. Okay, so let's jump right in. Number one, your training should be about reinforcement, not about isolating what you don't like. Okay. We want to grow our dog's confidence. And, you know, as I've said time and time again, our dogs are doing the best they can with the education that they have in the environment we've put them in. You as a dog owner with a dog who needs more confidence or a dog who is stressed or a dog who is anxious or a dog who's reactive, you are doing the best you can with the education you've been given in the environment you find yourself with your dog. All right. So the only way it's going to get better is if you grow that education. And while you're growing that education, you are not going to put yourself or your dog in a position where there's going to be judgment on either of you. Okay. So big, 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 I can't stress this enough. And some trainers might look at those dogs and say, oh, that dog's being an alpha. Oh, nay, nay. Oh, nay, nay. Please, please. You want to grow that dog's confidence by using a structured reinforcement-based program. Now, I'm not saying there's a lot of people trying to use just reinforcement, which nobody's using just reinforcement. Everyone's using some negative punishment somewhere. And inadvertently, we are all humans. And every once in a while, we are going to lose our patience. We might yell at a dog. And there we go, positive punishment. Okay. But there are some dog training programs that are just like dumping cookie bags at dogs. And there is a lot of confused dogs because of it. There's a lot of great dog training, but there's a lot of bad dog training as well. And so I want you to be very intentional. Don't take the dog training class that's just local, especially with so many options online. Point number one, be really intentional about choosing a program that's growing your dog's confidence and not using blame, judgment, or punishment to try and fix their behavior. Okay. Number two, I want you to know and grow your dog's reinforcement. And as I talked about in the last episode, believe the dog. Believe the dog when they let you know what their number one reinforcement is. Okay. Let me expand on that. I'm going to share with you some of my previous dogs, number one reinforcement, my very first dog that I owned of my own, Shelby, little Jack Russell Terrier, her number one reinforcement was a rock. It could be any rock. She didn't chew on them. She just held them. My previous sport mix who passed away just shy of 18 years, her number one reinforcement was a fly swatter. Now, Momentum, who is now my seven-year-old Border Collie, when she started out her agility career, she was not really driven. She really didn't like to tug. She was not your typical Border Collie. And so, I actually did a workshop for my Agility Nation membership called Building Motivated Momentum. Momentum now, today, is the most driven. She's up there with the highest drive dogs I've ever worked in the sport of dog agility. She got there by me believing her when she said, 
this is my number one high value reward. And for her, it was something she was previously afraid of, that I built so much drive for it, it became her number one reward. It was the chance to do a seesaw. Was terrified of the seesaw growing up, and I just put a lot of good dog training into it. It became her number one thing that I could grow value for anything. So, believe your dog when they say, this is what I like best. It might be food. It might be a toy. It might be an activity. So, for example, the seesaw is an activity, the chance to do a seesaw. But this is really important. I can't stress. This is like colossally, monstrously, like massively important. When you have activities the dogs love, there has to be some contingency that attach the activities back to you. It starts with, it's your choice. We build in the permission to do something. And that helps grow the anticipation of the chance to do something, grows the dog's focus and drive for that something. And so, whatever it is that activity is that your dog loves to do, you need it to go through you. It's not like they're pulling to do, oh, I want to go, I want to go in the pond. I want to go in the pond and you just take off the leash. That is a waste of permission. It didn't go through you. It was just the dogs pulling that gave them the opportunity to get what they want. Okay. Makes sense. So, believe your dog when they say, this is what I love best. And then you want to grow it so that the more reinforcements that we have as a dog trainer, the better and the easier dog training gets. So, guess what? Guess how I got Momentum's drive to tug? by using the seesaw. Okay? So, know and grow, believe the dog. Know and grow the reinforcements, believe the dog. Number three, you need to fall in love with journaling your dog's triggers. So, on the low end, there may be uh, what's called perception triggers. And those are, you know, you see a puppy and they see a leaf falling. They go, oh, what was that? Or they see a, a garbage bag on the street for the first time. Ooh, that's interesting. Or they see like a big black dog. Oh, I've never seen, that's, I've never seen a dog. So, perception triggers are something that they notice, the lowest stimuli that they notice. And that's where you can do generalization and desensitization conditioning for the dog, all right? At the other end are fear triggers, all right? That, oh my gosh, I'm terrified of thunder. That's a fear trigger. Now, when a dog has been triggered by fear, no learning can happen because they're in their back brain, they're in their lizard brain. And unlike humans, who we can say, hey, it wasn't thunder, it was just a car backfiring. We can't reason with dogs, so therefore those stress hormones stay in their body for much longer than it does with humans. Because like, if you think something was one thing and somebody goes, that wasn't really, oh, I feel so dumb, then you can laugh it off and the stress leaves your body much, much faster than a dog who we can't reason with them. So, if they're afraid, they're convinced they're afraid, no learning can happen once they've been triggered to the threshold of fear. So, what you need to do is journal what triggers your dog into fear and what triggers the dog's interest, curiosity right now. Because what we want to do is we want to eliminate or lower that. Now, what can we do with fear? You know, here are my dog's top 10 things that they're afraid of, or six things, or ideally, you might have only one or two that your dog is really triggered into fear. And then what you're going to do is you're going to grow distance away from that. All right? So, let me just say, triggers don't stay static. They're either lowering, like a puppy who sees leaf falling for the first time. Eventually, that just becomes white noise, right? Leaves fall. I don't care. Whatever. You know, a dog that's walked all the time in the city, they might see cars going by all the time. And at first they might go, whoa, that was interesting. Eventually, sometimes with good generalization and desensitization, it happens very, very quickly. The dog goes, oh yeah, that car never really comes near me. I'm fine with that, right? But if you don't actively do it, some dogs could grow either afraid of the car or the curiosity turns into interest to chase. So, my point is, triggers don't stay static. They either get lower or they grow in intensity and the dog starts triggering early and earlier and earlier. That means the threshold gets lower. For example, a dog who's afraid of thunder, guess what? What happens before thunder? Oh, it, uh, it gets dark. Okay. So, anytime it gets dark, I might start being worried. What else happens before thunder? Oh, it rains. Ah, so now even just a little sprinkle outside could trigger those dogs, right? The triggers either get worse for you and your dog, or they get better and that the dog learns to ignore them. 
You can become active and make sure they're always going in the right direction. If you just let it go the way of nature, your dog could end up with a lot of fears. Okay. So journal and actively work to improve those. Okay. Number four, know and grow your dog's confident zones. That is, where is your dog super confident, willing to learn, very relaxed, very engaged, and very focused on you? So for example, I have a 15 week old puppy that I'm working with. I have what we call a training den. We encourage all our students to set up a training den in their home. I have a training den downstairs in the lower level, super confident, loves going there. All good things happen. The other place that we train puppies super early is in my bedroom because it's carpeted. We can close off from the other dogs really easy. So training den, my bedroom, no other dogs. I have a very confident focused dog who just wants to work. Now, the next level would be out in our living area where if you've seen videos of my puppy ripping around my home, I have a very open concept home where she can go through the living room into the dining area and the kitchen is all one big circuit. So I get slightly less attentiveness if I'm out there training and no other dogs, but we've worked up to her being able to train with one dog. What if I took that puppy to a park? which we live in the country. So the park would have all kinds of different stimuli. Would that be a confident zone? No, it would not. So what you want to do is know and grow your dog's confident zones. If I say, where's your dog most confident? You can say, oh, training at home. Where? I've just given you three examples of different rooms in my home where I have different levels of confidence, depending on what's around those three different rooms. Okay. Know and grow. Make every room of your house a confident zone. Then introduce one distraction into that confident zone because the conditioning that's gone on with you, if you're practicing the good games that I have here on YouTube, your dog's been conditioned. When I go into this confident zone, all we do is have fun and I listen and I respond and everything's great. And so we want to grow that to other areas. So recently over the weekend, I started growing my confidence zone to outside with another dog. Cause I've got pretty good confidence outside with just me. Now I'm growing it to one dog outside. All right. So know and grow your dog's confidence zones. Number five, in podcast episode number 111, I talked about anchor dogs and I really, really believe this makes a big difference for dogs who are stressed or they get over aroused or they get triggered when they're out and about in an environment. So circulate with your friends, find, hey, does your dog get worried when there's like motorcycles? Would you mind coming with me? You know, who's a great anchor dog? Often it's dogs who are beyond their adolescence, you know, four or five to 15 years old that really are pretty chill about everything. Unless you're trying to create a dog who is more excited and then you want a dog who might get more excited in different environments. Okay. So anchor dogs are great. Point number six, I'm going to give you a little science here, something called matching law. And that is the reinforcement that your dog has been given for any behavior. In order to change that behavior, you have to get at least as high a reinforcement. I'm going to put a little asterisk in this. I don't want to go too deep because this could be a podcast all on its own. But if your dog has been given a ton of reinforcement for pulling on a leash in that they're, you know, they've gone to visit people or you've taken them off leash when they want to pull and visit somebody or when they want to go for a swim and you decided, I want my dog walking somewhere in my vicinity of my arm. Now, what you've got to do is you've got to either use unbelievably high value reinforcement to reinforce walking in the loose leash, or you've got to at least use the reinforcement at least at the value that the dog got previously for as same length of time. So if you've been walking with your dog for five years and let's say they didn't pull for all of that time, but they've been pulling for like, you know, six months worth of time, you're going to have to put in at least six months worth of at least equal reinforcement to overcome that. Or you do really good dog training and use higher value reinforcement. And that goes back to point number two that I talked about. And that is the values of your reinforcement. Okay. Matching law. It's always there. Can't fight against it, but it requires, and it dictates that you be a little more patient when you're trying to overcome a previous reinforcement history that dog has with the behavior you would like to change now. Oh, this is a good one. Number seven, you want to create active triggers for your dog. So just like there are perception triggers where the dog goes, Oh, I I can't focus on you right now because something's got my attention and I'm curious. And that curiosity, if you don't do anything about it, could morph into fear. All right. Or could morph into other things. So there are triggers that 
create fear or anxiety, but we can purposely create good triggers for our dogs. So I'm putting these into two categories. If we have a dog who tends to get too excited, we want to put in triggers that create calm. They could be behaviors. They could be physical touches. And the other side, remember in podcast 86, I spoke about the arousal curve and the arousal curve. We want to get our dogs into that peak zone. I spoke about that a little bit in podcast 167 as well. Well, if we have a dog who is too low on the arousal curve, they're taking in too many insignificant stimuli, right? And then they might go, Oh, I, I don't like that. Oh, I don't like that. If we can get their arousal up, they're not going to notice those things because they're having so much fun with you. So you're going to build in triggers. Those are games and phrases that change the dog's state. So the games will change their physiology, which helps moves them into the optimal arousal zone. If we have a dog who is too over aroused, those games are going to change the physiology and lower their excitement level by increasing the amount the dog breathes by getting the dog more focused and calm. Okay. So you want to create active triggers and that could go back to permission for activities that the dog has previously done. But regardless of the state the dog is in, I am very intentional about this. Not all dogs are the same, but you can categorize them as, oh, this guy's got a really quick trigger and that he goes up pretty quick or man, it's just like nothing excites this dog. And therefore they're taking in everything. Point number eight, please condition a love for all tools that you're going to use in dog training. You know, people say, we're going to use a clicker. We need to condition it. I've actually seen dog trainers say, you need to click and cookie a dog for five days before you can use a clicker in your training. Okay. That's conditioning a tool that actually doesn't need to be conditioned because the act of using it is conditioning it. You can just take it and start using it, provided the dog's not afraid of the sound, of course. Okay. But there are other tools. Nobody ever talks about conditioning a dog's love for, right? If you pick up a collar to put on the dog, you want the dog running towards you so that they can get the collar on. You pick up a leash, you want the same response. Actively condition the dog's love for those things. For example, with all of my puppies, I want them to spend some time on a head halter. So I will spend a lot of time every day conditioning their love of a head halter so it doesn't bother them when I choose to use it in my training. If a dog is a dog who stresses too high, it allows me to help turn their head towards a better choice for them. If it's a dog who stresses low, that head halter helps dogs be more confident because of the conditioning that's gone in with the head halter. It's super easy with a dog that is excited about something. I just have to wiggle their leash by that point. And they know that just like when I rode dressage, wiggling my bottom fingers, I could get my dog to take a round or my dog, I could get my horse to take a rounder form. So condition a love for any tool you want to use in your dog training. Number nine, if you have a dog who is sensitive, they're reactive, they need more confidence. Online training is a must for you because where else would you want to grow that dog's confidence and love rather than in the confident zones of your home? So you train that dog actively in an online environment. Of course, yes, we have online training classes, but I'm not just doing this to pump my own tires and to tell you how amazing we are. I'm telling you, there's a lot of people who have online classes now after COVID. You want to train your dog using these online classes before you try to train them somewhere else. Like if you want to do agility, get all your foundation training at home, just like I'm doing with our puppy. A lot of training in the house, a little bit outside. Very soon, there's going to be a lot more outside than there ever is in the house. Inside has got the confidence zones, all right? Train your dog using online classes, and then you can help grow their confidence and generalize that great confidence to all different environments, including other classes outside of the home. And point number 10, there's a stigma associated this one. And you're going to say, Susan, I thought these were all dog training points. They are, but this one I have to put in. Your dog training a lot of times will get easier if the dog who needs the behavioral medication is given behavioral medication. So if you are not having success with your dog training because your dog triggers into a high state of arousal and you can't help them, better living through pharmaceutics includes better training through pharmaceutics. It's not 
a cop-out. It's not that you've failed. Just like some people need pharmaceutics to help them deal with reality, a lot of dogs do so much better when we change that reality for the dog. Some of these dogs, when we get them on for, on meds early enough, you can start weaning them off after a few months or six months. But even if your dog feels more comfortable for the rest of their life on meds, that is what you should be doing. It is not a cop-out. It is not a failure. And your training will be far more successful. Okay. So there you have it. 10 ways that you can help your dog grow their focus, their confidence, lower their anxiety and lower their stress all with dog training. Let me know if there's any one of those 10 that you would like me to do a deeper dive on on an upcoming podcast. I'll see you next time right here on Shape by Dog. Tater hit the target. Now it's your turn. If you're not a subscriber to this page, go ahead and hit the subscribe button now and be sure to turn on the notification bell so you won't miss another video. And if you are already a subscriber, that's for you. Go ahead and get yourself a cookie.